we're uh, uh, continuing to work with uh, uh, Bob Jones. I think I told you about him, and uh, who's uh, who I've known for 15 years or so, 20 years. Um, who's on all kinds of councils and activities in Washington. Uh -huh. uh, he was with the Department of Labor and then was the head of the National Alliance of Business. And now, uh, when that closed down, well, he's he's uh, still totally involved in all these other activities. And so, uh, he and I are putting together, he's actively been working with uh, people in the Business Roundtable and the Chambers of Commerce and all the associations and so on. So, uh, we agreed to put together ideas for a leadership council of national leaders to um, try to shake up the media and the educational establishments and the foundations and the leaders in general to what we need to do to to reform education in the, in the broad sense. Uh -huh. um, and um, I just, uh, among in putting together a leadership council, I'm putting your name forth uh, because uh, I think you can give a broader picture of the reading problem than any of the research, any single researcher. Um, <clears throat> so you may not have a national reputation, but uh, you, uh, it's my view you are addressing the issue in a very broad way that can get the attention. Of, uh, of the media and, and uh, pr presidents of universities and so on. So, I think I can do that. Thank you. <clears throat> so I hope I hope that's okay. That's fine. I'd love to participate. Yeah. Um, good. Uh, so I want to confirm that, and I, you know, this is only in a memo form to Bob between Bob and me, and we're kind of uh, ironing it out. And this is the event that you told me to kind of pencil in for New York at. Uh, no. No, this is something else. Well, this is something totally different. different. Okay, okay. Totally different. Okay. Um, uh, this is just Bob and my idea is that, that the, uh, you know, this thing, I I think I sent you information about rising above the gathering storm. The right. Yes, sir. I read that and just found it to be, um, you know, having jumped over <laughs> um, the critical steps to... Well, exactly. That's the point. And so... I've approached the presidents when I was out there in Washington uh, of the National Academies, all three of them, including the, the you know, National Academy president of science himself, who's sort of the head of the, the pre academy, and uh, they understand where where we're coming from. That you know the 10 or 15 billion that the, they're talking about in Congress to improve math and science was, you know, necessary but not sufficient. It, 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 you know, it won't, it won't get much done. It won't work. It'll help a few of the people that need it the least. The, and it won't, it won't broaden the base. Right, exactly. It won't change, change education. So, so our, our Bob and my point is, okay, you know, that's fine. This is, this is the moment of truth, but uh, we need a broader approach. We need, we need to look at, this is the moment when, when business leaders are, are, are shaking in their boots scared out of their wits about future competition. Any, anybody who's read, you know, uh, the Earth is Flat, and, and that's widely been circulated in Washington, you know. Uh-huh. Um, so this is a moment of, of reform of education in general that we've been waiting for for 50 years. Well, that's great. I'd, uh, I, I'm honored and grateful for you putting my name into circulation to participate in this. Yeah, yeah. So, um, in the inner circle of about, you know, about 15 people, and uh, the, there's three things that are happening all at the same time, which are really exciting. So, two, in addition to the rising above the gathering storm, is getting a lot of attention on the New York Times and everywhere else, but uh, also the reauthorization for No Child Left Behind is coming up, and that needs to uh, needs attention. And it needs to be reauthorized, whatever improvements can be made in it, obviously, but it's still essential in my view. Yes. I, I don't know what you feel, but I feel that, that it's making a real change in the way teachers are teaching re reading. 
Right. I mean, I, I think that um, it's the necessary first step in developing the instrumentation right. that's necessary to kind of change the patterns. I mean, without accountability and some, some uh, pressure from outside, uh, teachers aren't going to change on their own. Right. A and, and what we learn is that we need to, to have teachers that are capable of differentiating their arsenal of resources in a way that's actually going to be optimal for the particular kids that they're working with. Right, right. And so on the one hand, we've got to create this incentive structure and accounting structure. And on the other hand, we've got to be careful not to turn them into robotic extensions of protocols they don't understand. Right. I'm in. Yeah? I'm in. That's it. That's, you got it. I mean, that's why I, I'd love to have you involved. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one. And that's the number two, I mean. And then the third one is, uh, which I heard about and, and was delighted to hear. Uh, the Congress has also asked the National Academies to come up with a, uh, a teacher training, teacher education uh, study to uh, figure out what can be done to improve education. With all, all the money and all the resources and all the time, energy, and, and, and the scores are, and NAEP aren't, aren't going up. Right. So they're saying, you know, let's look at teacher education. So, so they've assigned that to Ellen Lagerman at Harvard, Ken Shine down in Texas, and they've been working away at this the last year. And uh, the National Academies want to want to broaden that to include also a math and science. And I, I would say I'm in, but it just should include li literally all teacher education. Right. Uh, which uh, we might have to raise another half a million for or whatever to do that. But as long as they're doing it, might as well do it completely. Um, and uh, that's coming up at the same time. So, they're so it's a good time to be um, injecting into the dialogue some, some different thinking about all of this. That's right. Did you ever hear of the Flexner Report? Oh, yes. Well, they're likening, they're, they're saying this is what their uh, attempt is going to be. And here's the here's the, the my counterpoint or my the point that intersects for me with that is is that the the prevailing ethic in the medical community that could uh, could allow the co-registration of all of the information and research in the Flexner report to move m medicine in the direction it did was the underlying ethic above all else do no harm and I think that that has to to move into education circles as well we have to understand what's happening to children how it is that they're learning so as to not, um, you know, be doing widespread harm in our efforts to teach. Right. So I, I think the Flexner model of the medical, the medical model is a good model for education as long as we adopt its core ethic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So, um, so that's, uh, that's where we're at. Now, you, you said you had some... Yes. Um, well, I, I concluded the deal with proliteracy, and uh, we're in the process now of taking the content of the DVD you saw and putting it up on a uh, very robust and powerful national web server that Verizon and uh, proliteracy and the National Center for Family Literacy have, and it's going to take the videos that we've done and interconnect them to the research base, and it'll be online this fall. So that was a really uh, important step for us. At the same time, um, the relationship that we've now forged with proliteracy and the relationship between myself and Bob, the president of that organization, is we're um, moving to get Verizon and other big corporations, big uh, corporate foundations, um, behind the alliance I told you about. Now, the alliance includes the International Dyslexia Association, the American Library Association, the uh, Pro Literacy, of course, the National Center for Family Literacy, the National Center for Parents as Teachers, and a number of state organizations. Well, the who National Center for Parents as Teachers, that's not PTA. No, no. No, this is the National Center for Parents as Teachers, and it teaches parents how to be more effective teachers of their children at home and in relation to their schools. In the PTA history, and actually a... Uh, uh, unknown um, uh, counterproductive background because uh, w when you look into it, uh, it was really set up by the 
progressive educators to keep parents out of out of school. Yeah, to keep them busy. Keep them busy, and, 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 and uh, so I was. Uh, that was my first foray into education back in the, in if you will believe it in the fifties. Uh huh. When our kids were you know five and four, five, three, four, five, six. <clears throat> and so I became the president of our local PTA. And it said in the bylaws, thou shalt have nothing to do with uh, curriculum. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I thought, I thought, I've always felt like so much of what passes for quote-unquote parent involvement is to get parents to be mechanically, peripherally supportive, but distracted away from the real important stuff. Uh, when we started talking about some substantive stuff, he said, well, you shouldn't be doing that. And the superintendent was livid. Yeah. It was, it was really almost, almost <laughs> humorous. It was all tragic and humorous at the same time, so that that set me up to do something slightly different and start to help the court. Right. Now, the the National Center for um, Parents as Teachers is That's an good. entirely different thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, go ahead. So this is... Alliance. So the alliance is forming, and the purpose of the alliance again is to freely distribute about seventy thousand copies of the next generation DVD to teachers, parents, literacy volunteers, school counselors, juvenile justice workers, the various people that are on the edge and perimeter of this problem, um, <clears throat> both to take a certain core community of the population up into understanding this differently, but also to enlist them in our overall campaign, which, mo which moves from there to having all of them contact their local you know, cable access and public television stations and so forth to further pull what we're doing into the broad mainstream. Um, we've also begun working with Kentucky Education Te Television, which is one of the largest uh, independently operated PBS networks, sub-networks in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we get back in August, I'm about to hit the road again now, when we get back in August, uh, we're going to be working on the television broadcast for the general public. So um, we've, we've gone from things that were kind of theoretical to very concrete Actual contracted things now since last yeah, we well, talked. Yeah, congratulations on, on uh, putting the alliance together. I, I assume you're instrumental in putting the alliance together. Yeah, well, the the conception of it is is you know something I've been working on for a while, right. and what I needed was a, 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 the leader of a large national organization to step up and join me. The pro literacy. Yeah, and that's what pro literacy's done, both in terms of Tell actually. Tell me a little bit about pro literacy. Well, they're the um, world's largest literacy organization, operating in. 50-something countries, um, and basically every part of the globe, they have both a national um, literacy dimension here in the U.S. and then an international one. Um, relative to their national operation, they've got like 200,000 volunteers. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, and he really understands, he really understands um, some things that, uh, that not only the message that we're bringing in terms of understanding reading in a new way, understanding the challenge of the, to the brain, understanding the early life learning trajectories that set up how well somebody gets through the challenge, understanding the code itself and the relationship between the code and the challenge and how all that relates to instruction. And he, he has come to a point where he recognizes the value in getting the population to understand it, to have a shift in how we think about this. And so that's really okay. important. Uh -huh. um, but he also, he also appreciates... Just one second. Yeah. Okay. Um, he also appreciates the, uh, some of the things that we're working on to teach teachers differently. Right. Um, we've we've come up with something, and and, and I, I've not got into that with you. I want to wait till we get a chance to meet. Okay. There's some things I want to show you about um, ways that we can conduct teachers into um, having a synchronized experience in real time with the confusion, frustrations that are happening inside the minds of children that are struggling. Right. So we've developed ways to do that that he's very excited about, and that we're going to. Uh, translate into the adult literacy world as well. It's so frustrating when our our granddaughter goes to the local uh, local uh, Montessori school, and they just, the teachers, the administrators just don't have the 
They've got a philosophical bias against thinking about this in certain ways. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, a, a in denial. Yeah. So, um, that's, that's really exciting. Okay. Um, do you, uh, that, that's an interesting organization, the Pro Literacy. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, as you know, I'm interested in literacy in general. Uh -huh. Do you have any sort of background paper on the Pro Literacy organization? Um, you can email? What I could easily do is email you to their website, which is pretty extensive, and that will okay. give you a scope sense of their national and international operations in an interactive way that okay, you can Okay, that's just, great. Yeah. Well, that would be nice. Okay. If you just email it to me, we'll print out. I will. I will. Okay. So um, <clears throat> what do you think are the next steps in the next time? Um, so I'm working with Bob, and we're going to try to get this memo circulated and send you a copy and see what you think about it and to edit it and mark it up and whatever, digest it, and we'll go from there. Okay. That's from our, from our point of view what, you know, it's, it's basically uh, Bob's and my great song. I say, Bob, Bob is the guy who said, we need a leadership council. I said, absolutely, let's, let's, do, it. let's do it. So I gave him a whole proposal. Good, good. Well, I'm looking forward to receiving that then. So we're hot on it. Um, any more word on anything happening in Chicago? We talked once about maybe something happening this, this oh, summer yet. Uh, yeah, they're going to be meeting on the 15th of August. Um, uh, let me see if I should call phone Peggy and see whether I can get you involved in that. That's a good point. They just ta called yesterday. Oh, huh, uh, okay. Well, we're so synchronous. I'll, I'll, put, I'll, put them, I'll see if I can reach Peggy uh, with the uh, Chicago Community Trust. I can barely hear you if you're talking to me. Fifteenth of August possible for you? The fifteenth of August is possible for me um, if I get enough notice on it. I'm actually uh, leaving tomorrow for California, and I'll be in California through the second of August. Well, but I'll, I'll uh, you're, you're probably in touch with your office, so. Yeah, and and uh, you can also email me anytime. Okay. And uh, the other thing I do is give you my personal cell phone if that's helpful. Please. Okay, it's eight zero eight. Okay. Six five two. Yeah. Two five zero one. I'm doing a really interesting event in Oakland on Saturday. Oh. The newly elected mayor, um, who was um, a real fire, a fireball of power in the U.S. House, uh -huh. and then came back to Oakland to try to clean it up, um, and the uh, his number one mission is to transform education. And they had a, uh, a ballot bill passed to to give them 400 million dollars to do it with. Oh. And um, and so they got um, three different colleges, the chancellors of three different uh, uh, community college districts, um, and a college together with the um, you know the political business roundtables and all that stuff. And they're bringing these people together to hear me out this Saturday in Oakland. Well, they're using open court in Oakland. Yeah. Do you know that? Yeah, do I? I do recall that now. Yeah, I used to do some work with the uh, oh, that, gr Girls Inc. Tie into what they're doing. Yeah, I'll remember to bring that up and talk about that. Okay. Okay, Good. well, great to talk to you, David. And we'll Good talking with you. Enjoy the rest of your time there. All right, right. Thank Take you. care now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah. I'm doing good. Thanks for calling. Uh, um, David, I've been looking through your uh, papers, and uh, uh, I, think they're, I think they're terrific. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, the Education Writers Association this weekend down in New Orleans. You know what that is? I, I'm... I'm Familiar with it, but I've never been to one. The uh, the journalists who write about education. Uh huh. They they have an association for the last thirty or forty years, and it's pretty powerful stuff. Because they, they, whenever they have a uh, the, the journalists are basically suffering from uh, deadline problems that they never have enough time for anything. Right. Uh, so they can't do the research, and therefore they have a, a handbook in which they look things up and. So they have references for every subject, including literacy, of where to go to. Right. Um, they probably don't list you. I haven't seen their book lately. No, although we've had a number of uh, you know uh, releases that have appeared in Education News, which is plugged into that network. Education Week. Education Week, yeah. 
Right. No, education yeah. news, that's, the, the online. That's exactly right, and so it might be. But anyway, um, and then I'm going to, uh, then Chicago is kind of canceled until about midsummer, late summer. Okay. And, and I think that we might be able to uh, get some exposure to the top brass there, depending on the, on the schedules. So uh, I'll keep it. And then uh, the other thing is, is I'm talking to, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm, I'm going to the, uh, a, a National Academy of Sciences meeting, uh, and you know they, they've been responsible for the um, preventing reading failure, and and then down to the No Child Left Behind, and and the booklet, uh, put reading first. Have you seen that? Uh huh. Uh huh. I have. The little one, thirty-five page summary of the summary of the summary. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> and it's pretty great. It's good stuff. It's, it's right on. Gene Shaw, Gene um, Osborne put it together. And uh, she uh, <coughs> was the uh, director of the Center for Study Reading in, in Urbana, <coughs> Illinois. Uh huh. And um, there, you know, the National Academy is where they, they've done more than anybody else to resolve the reading wars, as you probably must be aware of. I'm aware of their participation and their support for um, a number of documents that got out into the world. Yeah, solid phonics, right? Exactly. For the first time, I never seen anything. The federal government never did much. Um, at any rate, uh, the the topic now, of course, is math and science. You, you've read about the news, of course. Right. And uh, the National Academy came out with a report: um, "Rising Above the Gathering Storm." Yes, which I which you sent me. I sent you. Which which which. Uh, I both appreciated and thought really fails to appreciate the effect of reading in proficiency on <coughs> subsequent uh, developments, including math well, and science. Well, that's exactly the point. Uh, and uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm talking to the, um, the president of the National Academy. Okay. I'm having lunch with him on the 21st and going to make that connection. And I, I don't, uh, and, and there's also, in, in your... Uh, Written, written stuff. I have, you know, I, I haven't seen a completed documentary in, you know, the DVD or, or tape or anything. But in the written well, I did send you the DVD, right? Yeah, yeah, you oh, did. Okay. Uh, but in your written materials, in the last uh, page or two, uh, you have a kind of a summary statement of how reading causes all these problems, cause billions of dollars of damage and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, you don't document that. You don't you don't give an authority. It's just sort of an uh, uh, sort of an editorial. You know, it seems to me that uh, uh, there there are some of the groups, uh, Alliance for Excellence Education, or some of them have done some studies that I don't have my hands on because I'm up in my summer home right now. Mm -hmm. um, they say they've calculated uh, the cost of dropouts of being about 300 billion a year. Right. If you calculate their lifetime earning loss versus what it what it should be at a medium, well, nothing nothing really high powered, but just sort of average rate. On the um, DVD, there's a section called costs, um, both economic and price, and there you have um, Wedgworth and others speaking to the American Medical Association's report on the 72 billion dollars. From there, you have Whitehurst saying that there's no question that the cost of the price tag of this is hundreds of billions of dollars a year. So um, there's that's great. There yeah, that's great. I, I, I didn't see the whole thing, so okay. must, either I forgot that or missed it or whatever. Okay. Uh, because that's really important. It seemed to me that from a rhetorical point of view that um, it costs and the economics that is driving American businessmen and leaders of business of Intel, you know, Craig Barrett and the rest of them, um, kind of crazy. He's getting their attention, so to speak. Right. Um, and if, if, if uh, I would recommend you put some of those summary statements up in the very beginning of your papers, because that's what grabs their attention immediately. Okay. I, I definitely appreciate that. That's a different audience trying to speak to business leaders. I have a um, all-day meeting next uh, Monday with the president of Proliteracy, and we are designing a campaign to uh, get to politicians and business leaders that will have the quality of overture that you're speaking of. Yeah, well, it, I think the politicians too in Congress are 
are looking at costs. Um, and they, uh, you know, they're saying, you know, a billion here, a billion there, uh, it's just too much. Uh, they don't realize that it's hundreds of billions that we're losing every year. Yes. Um, I've seen it calculated, you know, years ago that it, the mistakes in writing that people make because they can't write, you know, only about 5% of America or less than that can write. He's writing a decent paragraph. Um, because uh, they can't write clearly and accurately and make mistakes, they don't proofread. It costs 100, 100 billion a year or more. Yeah, and the bigger problem, which is that they don't have the capacity to organize their thinking. Yeah, exactly. which is which is an exactly. outgrowth exactly. of not being transparent at the mechanics level. The lack of writing is to the fact that they don't read. Yeah. So it seems to me that uh, it would be valuable to connect all those things up. Oh dear, their phone is ringing. Uh, well, I go for a well. Um, at any rate. Um, uh, I'm really enthusiastic what you're doing. Well, thank you. Appreciate your support. I'd like to spend some time with you on the whole rhetorical uh, aspect of it. Okay. Of uh, how we can be most effective to because you 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 you've got more a broader view of the whole issue than anybody I've ever seen. So it's, it's really fun to to and, and it would seem to me when I talk to the National Academies that they have to uh, I'm going to try to light a fire under underneath them the leaders. Uh, to say, you know, math and science is, is great to repair, but it will never work unless you get the literacy issue cleaned and, up. And there's a, there's a remarkable and, and very powerful connection between the two that's uh, having to do with the emotional aversion, that, that people, people all over the place have, have math phobia, and math phobia is an exemplifier of the same phenomena happening in reading. Right. Right, it's it's an unnatural uh, confusion engendered by a code and an artificial system of relating to it that's causing people to feel like there's something wrong with themselves, and so they want to avoid it. And the more you avoid it, the bigger the gap. The bigger it gets, and it's a downward spiral. So when we say children of the code, ultimately we want to branch into that because it's spelling, writing, okay, that's exactly the point. mathematics. They're all the codes. Is the teachers themselves are afraid of it. They don't. They don't get it. Right. And the teachers, of course, the teachers don't get reading either. I mean, I, I'm talking. To, uh, I'm going to be talking to our uh, kindergarten, our Montessori teacher, who just does not have the picture. You know, in a Montessori school, they shouldn't allow to get by. Right. They have a Everything sense of this thing being a, a, a comparatively natural development if the child is ready, and and. Uh, and they've done, for as good as they've been on so many levels, they've done a real disservice with that attitude towards reading. No, it's, uh, it, it, and, she, and she doesn't at all. She doesn't and hires about five or six teachers, and, and they just aren't, they don't, they don't have the background to insist on making sure that they systematically go from left to right and get every sound, and that they learn their sounds properly, and they don't recognize the letter combinations. Of the, of the CHs and the THs and the OUs, the OUGHs, the IGHTs is, are a real pattern. It's yes. Like it's, yes. Not a, it's not a problem. It's, it's actually quite regular if you if you just know the 93 spellings. Uh, right. Well, again, um, it isn't the the issue isn't what us adults who understand it and can think about it in terms of patterns and uh, an, uh, of analysis. Um, you know, <clears throat> the problem is, what are the kinds of confusions the child's actually experiencing? Right, that's exactly right. No, the, the, the adults is usually jump over and learn those, learn the code, so that it's automatic and they don't even think about it. Right, and then we think about how to teach from that perspective rather than from right. really right. being in sync with what the child's confusions are as they're happening in real time. That's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So our, our granddaughter... Who, who I don't think that is particularly, you know, brilliant or anything, but she she did better on there. She's six in, uh, and a half now, and she's the teacher said, well, she did better than anybody they've ever had in school. Um, just because you know, we're we're careful and spend a few hours with her to make sure she knows how to read. Yeah, yeah. It gets over that hurdle. Yeah. Well, again, I mean. Um, Reed Lyon, Louisa Boats, and others have said, um, even though they're strong phonics advocates, that 
a child that's ready, that has the linguistic bl building blocks, who's got the uh, emotional resiliency, um, can learn to read through just about any cockamamie system. But, for, for, but, but and actually use that language. But for the children that have been insufficiently prepared for the challenge by virtue of their life learning trajectories, they're in real danger if we don't um, meet them on the edge and systematically individuate, you know, a ramp for them through this. Right. And that's what that's the <clears throat> the main. Well, and, the, and then the parents just give give up. Uh, parents and teachers just don't realize that it, it, it can be done if you if you just carefully and go through it carefully. They don't, they don't get it either. Well, that's why we need something that's that's short and explosive. That's a, a kind of national standard reference for teachers, for parents, for anybody who's interested in this to be able to wrap their heads around it without having to go to college for two years. I mean, that's part of the reason we're doing what we're doing. In a few hours, you need to hit them over the head with a four by four to so you realize, hey, if you want your kids to read, you can do it. That's not hard. It's just just to, 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 to go to devote attention to it. Right. Okay, well, it's great. Well, uh, Great to talk to you, uh, David, and uh, I'll uh, I'll keep you informed about EWA and NAS and the rest of it. I appreciate it very much, and um, I could, uh, if you think it's appropriate to to share the material I shared with you, with either of those groups, you let me know, and I'll send you another uh, packet of uh, similar materials. Um. Well, I mean. I can photocopy that. I mean, that's not a problem if you if you if you want me to or not. I mean, I, I can do that. You don't have to send me anything. Okay. Well, feel so free I'm to because I want to be home one day. Okay. I'm going to be home Wednesday tomorrow, and then I'll, I'm leaving Thursday. Okay. Well, free, what I mean. feel free to do that. And if they contact me, uh, I'll be glad to send them, uh, uh, you know, a DVD as well. But there are some key people in in the. Uh, Education Writers Association is uh, uh, we we got to really get to the, the Hickinger Group uh -huh. up, in, up in New York uh, because uh, Richard Col Col Richard Colvin really is a powerful vehicle to get to the education media. Well, I really appreciate your championing and advocacy here. And uh, well, is there yeah. anything I can do to support? Well, you need to find somebody who who really understands the problem you know, from a national point of view. Anyway, good to talk to you, Dick. Good talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. I'm a 24-7 <laughs> guy. Same here. Um, David, uh, we had a very interesting meeting at uh, New Orleans. Yes? Tell me about it. Uh, well, um, um, I've been going to those meetings for a long time, and I've supported their Buskin lecture for Twenty-five, thirty years. So I've seen it grow from a very minuscule organization to to one of the most important in America. I mean, the, the journalists are basically the gatekeepers. They're the ones who who get the information out to the public, and the public is is basically very poorly informed. Uh, but the journalists themselves have made enormous progress in the last twenty years. In terms of being responsible for their own learning and what um, they need to convey, yeah, yeah they have the, the organization is uh, has become uh, very professional. Uh, they understand the importance of uh, providing information and giving access to journalists. Uh, you have to recognize that uh, education, the education beat, is the lowest on the totem pole. It has been in the past. Right. Um, so they get the, the the rookies out of college. And pay them the least amount, and uh, they immediately are, are jumped into the world of journalism, which means that uh, the, the the publishers, by and large, <coughs> squeeze them to the limits and don't have any time to do any research. Yep. And so all they reported on before was strikes, uh, squabbles, uh, corruption, uh, crimes, uh, personal vendettas, etc. Et right. No policy. No, no that, core understanding of what's underneath it all. No, because that would be considered too complex and risky and. and well, yeah, that, that's right. That's right. Risky and uh, controversial, and they don't want to get their feet. They don't want to get uh, sued for libel and all. All, all that rest of that stuff. Yep, which is part of what just keeps the system dumb. So that's that's really uh, so. Board members 
who supposedly are so, uh, give, are given the responsibility to run schools, uh, don't have a clue. Yeah. And they still don't have a clue, by and large. You know, I did talk with the um, uh, executive director of the uh, school, National School Boards Association, uh -huh. um, ones that, bre that create educational experience for school board members, and I'm working on that cha channel. Parenthetically, keep going. I just want to let you know that while we were passing by. Yeah, well, a representative of the National School Board Association was there. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the Lisa and her staff and her board, her board is a very strong board, um, and they all participate actively. Uh, for example, the editorial writer of the USA Today was there, and, and an active board member, and, and, and a very intelligent guy. Uh, John Merrow, do you know who John Merrow is? No. The guy who, who does Learning Matters, the sort of an adjunct to uh, the News Hour. Oh, okay, yes. Who does education reporting for Everlair. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, he's a senior vice president, and or secretary, I guess, of the organization, and, and interviewed Tom Luce. Do you know who that is? No. He's the assistant secretary of education. Okay. The U.S. government, you know, the Department of Education, um, who was very articulate, and, and both uh, John, uh, I, I've known John for 15 years, um, asked very probing questions, the right questions, about No Child Left Behind, and uh, Tom Luce was, was uh, articulate, uh, uh, had the uh, figures at his, uh, at his fingertips, and, uh, and he, uh, he was funny, and he was very persuasive. So, and of course, the main speaker was Craig Barrett of Intel, uh -huh. Department of Intel, talking about uh, the STEM initiative, the, the uh, rising above the gathering storm. Yes. Um, so they, and they, they, they had the, the people there from three or four different points of view of the corruption in the New Orleans schools, which was already under, under investigation before Katrina. Um, and, yes, uh, and then confused and, yeah, right, right. Uh, it, it's been under, as, as it's pointed out by a number of people, you know, for decades, uh, there's been corruption going on. People were on the payroll that were dead. They said they couldn't account for $70 million. out of $500 million. They couldn't account for, you know. So that was really a, a sick situation, which was more, as in, more, as in many uh, large school systems, they're more there for jobs than they are for educating kids. Yep. Yeah, the, the Martin Haberman's work. Have you encountered him? No. He uh, developed the uh, um, teacher core. Oh. and developed a, an assessment system for being able to see, to assess where teachers are at on entry into the system and to whether, you know, what's motivating them and how well they're going to do and so forth. Right. And, uh, you know, the composite of his work is just an incredible story of all the things that work against anybody yeah. learning anything in education. Right. It's just, it's just atrocious. But we have a fantastic three-hour interview with him about that. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, uh, a guy from uh, well, the co-founder of the KIPP schools is there. Do you know what they are? Um, I'm, I remember the name, but I can't place it right now. Um, and he was one of the, um, what do they call it again? Uh, uh, teachers, teachers for America. Do you know what Teachers for America is? Um, it's uh, Wendy Cop thing. Okay, I remember her name Wendy Cop. Yeah. Yeah, she started that about, oh, I guess ten years ago, of uh, recruiting uh, students from graduates from the Ivy League colleges to teach in the inner city. Uh huh. And now they're up to when he was there, it was about five hundred. Now it's about they're taking two thousand a year that that uh, of the brightest, the youngest, and the brightest uh, going into the inner city. Wow, that's a remarkable accomplishment. They had 19,000 applicants. Well, they're, they're doing real good message work, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're, they're volunteering for, for, and half of them uh, then stay in education and do something like him. So it's a, it's a great story. Yeah, it is. It is. And uh, I had a good talk with Richard Colvin of Heckinger Institute. I told you about him. Yes. And... Uh, 
He's been commissioned. You, you ever hear the National S Society for the Study of Education? It's an honorary organization, uh, voluntary. Uh, it publishes yearbooks on the, the state of the world in education. No, no it sounds really familiar to, to me. They were at the University of Chicago for a lot of, you know, 50 years. I think they moved away the last year or two. They, they moved to, to Washington State? I think so. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. I'm tracking now. NSSE. Vaguely. And he, yeah. They asked Richard to uh, put together a uh, one of the volumes next in 2008 on um, sort of for public consumption instead of just for for the for the inner circle or for the Cunha City. Um, so that's that's a real challenge. So we we were talking about all kinds of things that we should put in there, so, such as you know the kind of stuff you're doing. I think they were the, they were the organization that gave some award to Engelman at one point, and uh, could be. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's how I think I remember trying to. Okay. On that. Anyway, um, so it was a great meeting. Great meeting. Uh, so it was exciting, and I uh, had the, the, the chance. Uh, Lisa, I, I know Lisa personally. Uh, we when for the, for example, uh, when we had the IBI meeting in Berlin. International Board and Books for Young People, mm -hmm. uh, which is the organ international organization for children's literature. Okay. Um, we've been going to those for 30 years. Um, every two years, they give the Little Nobel Prize for children's literature. Huh. So the, the Anderson Award. Okay. Which is, which is the highest award there is in the world for children's literature. Huh. So um, Anna that. was coaching. Virgi Did you ever hear the name Virginia Hamilton? Yes, well, I can't place She's it. Black writer from not far from you, Southern Ohio. Uh huh. Who passed away about three or four years ago with cancer. She was on our advisory board for cricket. Uh huh. Uh, and uh, so Mariana was coaching her to speak German because she had to introduce it to the German, basically a German audience in Berlin. <laughs> huh. Uh, and we invited Lisa Walker. And her, uh, her one of her associates with the Lisa Walker is the ed executive director of uh, of uh, education writers. So we invited Lisa and Virginia Hamilton and her other friend uh, for to the Berlin Symphony. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, that's that's uh, 15, 14, 15 years ago. So we got invited uh, to the uh, sort of the closed group of the board and and the and the contributors from. Uh, the Illumina Foundation and uh, uh, Illumina Foundation. Oh, the Illumina Foundation uh, from the Intel and and uh, other other foundations that supported. Others. And so I had the opportunity to sit next to um, Richard Whit Whit Whitlock Whit Whitlove something Whit like something like that. Who is the uh, Editorial writer at the at the U.S. Today, U.S.A. Today. Uh huh. And had a good chat with him about everything under the sun. Um. <clears throat> and uh, so, and and I, I I gave him, for example, a copy of your four or five page summary of uh, Children of the Code. Uh huh. And he'd never heard of you, so you may expect a call. Well, that would be great. He's the editorial. He the editorial, the editorial writer for education in, in USA Today. Excellent. Uh, US, yeah, USA Today. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, not at all. No, I, I gave away about 10 copies to various, various VIPs. Oh, good. Good. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's, oh, good, it's, good, well, good, good, to, it's good to be working together in that way. Yeah, all right. That's, uh, that's a, I was very happy. I'm, as far as I'm concerned, which what you've been doing, you really ought to lead, you have to lead the interference or or take the lead in uh, in this literacy issue. Well, so here's what I'm going to propose. I want, I just want to run through this by you. It makes any sense when I talk to the president of the National Academies uh, of Engineering and Sciences, uh, which I'm supposed to be uh, at uh, the 21st. I, I assume it'll happen. Um, I'm going to propose to them that. Uh, the 10 or 15 billion that the Congress might be spending, and the president supporting both parties is a bipartisan issue, as Tom Lou said. Um, that 
um, it's never going to, it's not realistic until we solve the literacy uh, and, and numeracy issues. Yes. So, yeah. All the, all the, the we're never going to close the gap. We're never, gonna, we're never going to stop the dropout rate until we get considerate. Yep. I, yep. I don't think there's, there's any question about it. We, we, we can certainly improve how, how effectively we teach certain things for those kids that make it over the obstacle course wall, but we can't move the population unless we change the obstacle course wall. And, and the obstacle course wall amounts to, you know, starting in second, third, and fourth grade. It's, it's, the, it's the whole code learning of, that's involved in numeracy and literacy. Right, right. You gotta, you gotta get them into, into enjoying reading, so they read on their own. Uh, you know, something like uh, uh, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, half an hour a day. Yeah. And they have to, in order, in order to do that, uh, we have to get the message out to every teacher in the country and parents that are listening. Of course, most won't. Most in the inner city won't. They won't even. They don't have any parents, or they just, you know, nobody's really responsible for them for their intellectual development. Right. So it has to go to the teachers and the supervisors and to get the message to the kids so, they, so the children themselves know that if, if they don't want to read, they've lost it. There's a, there's a window that they have to do it when they're second, third, or fourth grade. And if they don't make it by the fifth grade, well, you know, their, their life is ruined. Well, their, their life is on a, uh, a trajectory towards danger and it becomes progressively harder for them to change that trajectory. Right. Yeah. Right. So they have to know it. And the parents have to know it. The teachers have to have to recognize it and take yep. responsibility for it. Yeah, to me, it's it's like um, taking the lead out of the gas. To me, you know, it's it's like uh, it's a it's a public health, uh, national intelligence, national security, national economy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's all of those things rolled into one. Right. Yeah. That's how important it is. Yep. Absolutely. So I, I'm I'm going to make that case. I'm going to say I'm going to. Say, you know, if, if you want to hear what needs to be done, you've got to talk to uh, Children of the Code. Talk to David. Wow. Thank you. I, I, uh, I really appreciate you going to bat for us that way. Now, um, connected to this, I spent yesterday in a six and a half hour meeting with the president of Pro Literacy. I, I don't know Pro Literacy. They're the world's largest literacy organization. Okay. They have 200,000 volunteers operating in 33 countries. Their biggest oh. operation is in the U.S., of course. They're primarily focused on adult literacy. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's, um, that's why I have a big idea. Yeah. I, I spent uh, today at lunchtime with the president of the National Center for Family Literacy. Oh, I, I've heard of them through, through the Chase Ma uh, uh, Bank in Chicago. They want me to talk to them. Right. And um, what I'm in doing is using the DVD and the Children of the Code content yeah. to, as a catalytic agent to draw together the leaders of the major um, learning organizations that are functioning in spaces connected to literacy. Okay. And so I mean, maybe that the adult literacy, the family literacy, um, the uh, American Library Association, the International Dyslexia and Association. And is ALA, are you working with ALF? I'm working with, yes, ALC. Yeah, ALC, that's right, the executive director of, uh, of uh, ALC. This is Brown? Yeah. Um, Malore Brown? She's the successor, yeah, and I have had conversation with her, but I really got all this going with the woman who was the head last year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Malora is a very, very intelligent woman. We, we know her. Okay. So they've agreed to be part of the alliance, and the way that the alliance works is we've got these national leaders, and they've all agreed to distribute Children of the Code DVDs to their members. Oh. Right? And then we're taking the collective inferential power of all of them together up to Verizon to fund it all. Oh wow! And that's what's in process right now. So that we can, so two things happen. So Number, Verizon, a guy understands what you're talking about. Well, Verizon's put many millions of dollars into a joint venture between NCFL and uh, Pro Literacy to what's called the Verizon Literacy Campus. Okay. okay. And what I'm pro proposing to do is to um, make this DVD distributed through all these alliance members, funded by Verizon, so that v Verizon gets promotional, you know, uh, sponsorship sure. acknowledgement, sure. um, and that this, uh, the DVD itself points back to the collective master literacy website for getting more research and training information and teaching information and so forth. So it's, it's kind of the center of an engine rather than a static separate component.
and that the distribution of the DVD is designed to get 65,000 people out there in the country calling their local PBS station saying, Put, get this on the air as a documentary for everybody else so that it folds back around a second time. Mm -hmm. So that, it, that it's inclusive because all, so many of these different distinct entities, their leaders are plugged right in at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I'd like your uh, comment about uh, your, your opinion of the organization called uh, uh, Sylvan, Sylvan Learning. You know, I've, um, I've, I, I frankly, I think for the most part that um, they prey upon parental fear. Now, I, I have to say that at a distance. I've not gone in and studied them. I have um, popped into a couple of workshops to look at how they present the case for what they're doing, and I found it to be outdated, superficial. And <laughs> Sorry about that. My machine just squeaked. Um, and that that uh, what I what I my I have had one interactor in, interaction with somebody who was the director of all Hawaiian Sylvan operations. Right. And it was in that interaction that um, I realized to them it was uh, very much a farm like business, and that that the majority of their business came from very well to do parents who were. Um, trying to uh, feel good about giving their children a competitive edge. Right. So right. Like the uh, Japanese uh, uh, private schools. So right. Get your kids into so, first grade or something like so that. So I think there's a place for that, you know, and it's, it's not the, um, the philosophical center from which to come to try to make change in the world. No, no, no not at all. But right. It's but, an, but I, uh, they're... Uh, they're making overtures uh, to us for the magazines right now. I see. I have been. I have never approached them. Um, with the there, there have been some people at Sylvan that almost set up a workshop for a series of Sylvan centers to come and hear me, um, but I never pushed it, and it didn't materialize. Even though there's been three or four Sylvan local leaders that have come to different events and have been all charged up with what we're doing, um, I've never push them, to, you know, to go into um, Sylvan and try to engage them because right. I, I just felt like they were a, a um, potentially um, dangerously biased organization for me to mix with too early. Well, and they're being a for-profit organization, they could be a problem for you too. Yeah. So now, <clears throat> one of the things that I'm working on as an adjunct to this alliance-driven DVD distribution we've just right. mentioned. Okay. Was to, is to use corporate sponsored DVDs. In other words, um, I've engaged in a conversation with the director of marketing at Scientific Learning. <laughs> Scientific Learning uh, makes fast forward and other neuroscience based uh, technology products for use in school laboratories to help kids in need. Are you familiar with them? Uh, no, I don't know them. Okay, they actually have probably. What's the name again, Scientific Learning? Scientific Learning. Okay. Yeah, they're out in uh, Oakland. And that means, does that scientific learning mean uh, a methodology to learn in general, or, or does it mean to learn about science? It's, 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 no, 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 it's, it's, it's a, it's a um, neuroplastic-based approach to um, um, teaching children fundamental processing skills. Okay, okay. Almost unconsciously teaching them fundamental processing skills. Okay, okay. So, so it's like uh, an automated Linda Mood Bell, if that's helpful. <laughs> a technological Linda Mood Bell in a way, but they have hundreds of thousands of kids in the most sophisticated database going out there um, relative to uh, bringing up phonological, uh, core phonological processing in kids. Yeah. Anyway, the, the, their head of marketing got a hold of me last week, and uh, I had interviewed one of their key um, scientists, actually two of their scientists over the years, the only one of which is still there. And uh, they're really hot about what we're doing and wanted to, you know, how they could help promote what we're doing to, it, throughout all the educational leadership circles as they go out into the world doing their thing. Right. And to make a long story short, what we're proposing is to, you know, make them five or 10,000 DVDs for them to give out 
that will have uh, a sponsorship acknowledgement for them doing it, but that will also carry the Children of the Code core message without any endorsement of them out into another dimension of the population. Sure. Right. And, and, and they will put up, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 for that, which contributes to what we're doing. Right, right. Great. So I'm trying to glue together this nonprofit alliance and supplement it with this uh, for-profit participation that's kept at an arm's length and that still results in the DVDs going out for free to the end users. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what, I, what I'm sort of thinking of and, and as my goal, my, which, you know, you, you, you never, you never can achieve your goal if you don't have a goal. Exactly. Um, <laughs> would be to um, encourage the guys at National Academies that they're going to have to come out with another report after the rising above the gathering storm to 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 say what to what it's going to take to make it all work. Yes, and to therefore have the access to national science money as well as Intel and all the other corporations that are involved in, in this rising above the gathering storm, the whole STEM initiative. Um, to get at, to get at least the credibility and the authority of the National Academies behind it. Yes, and at the center of it all. Yeah, they're the ones that, that really solved the reading wars back, you know, with the Snow, Catherine Snow. Right. And the math wars with the Kilpatrick. Book. Well, they, they they solved it at a certain layer, but the, but it didn't uh, penetrate to uh, to the kind of social transformation that's necessary. No, no, not at all. Not at yeah, all. and no. and and that comes from the difference between. Um, putting forth compelling scientific uh, argumentation and engineering social education by finding where the fulcrums of change are. Well, to say how bad it is, uh, when we had a meeting at the Hunter College in January to re reconstitute the Council for Basic Education, um, sort of the, the, the first in the, in the 50s to fight progressive education, uh -huh. uh, to counter, counter, let's say. Um, um, the dean of, of Hunter, you know, they have 10,000 students. They did, and a lot of the graduates in, uh, not all in education, 2,000 in education, and a lot of those go to the New York City schools. Well, in looking around, and the dean is pretty pretty savvy. He, he knows he knows pretty well what research-based instruction is. And he says they, they search high and low in the country, and they can't find anybody to meet uh, uh, meet what they their criteria for. Uh, for heading up their uh, reading instruction program, I can't find anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Not one. Yeah. Now there are five or ten in the country who are good. You know, Isabel Beck in Pittsburgh, or, or um, you know, there's a dozen names around, but um, they won't move. They're senior people. Uh, Louisa, uh, like 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 uh, Louisa Mo. Right. You know, she's not going to do that. Right. Yeah, and it's it's not that simple unless unless there's a, enough of a rich dialogue to really understand what we're doing together. Otherwise, these people jump into a a, a cage. Well, most universities still are are impossible. The environment is not good. It's right up here. I talked to Timothy Tim about that. Tim Shanahan. Yes. And uh, he says, well, the environment just isn't there. Yeah. In the universities. Yeah. And that's what. That's what your message has to get to the trustees of the universities and to to the. the it'd be fun to call a meeting of the presidents or whoever the deans or whatever you would want to call the academic officers of the hundred research universities. Yes. To try to get them to take some responsibility for their lousy departments of education. Well, that's what I hope this alliance can do by having a roundtable mm -hmm. that that is populated by you know high caliber. Folks that represent um, deep roots of work in this problem from different facets, you know, from early childhood development, from juvenile justice, from the economics, from the, and that, that there's a roundtable of, of inferentially strongly powerful names that have organizational depth and history towards trying to solve this problem. Together, they can be a catalytic call to pulling together groups like you're talking about now, in a way that I could never do. I don't know the government can do, or or anybody else could get away with, you know. Well, the national academies could do it. Yeah, now you're right. The national academies could do it. Yes. Yeah. That, that's the purpose of getting them to yeah. behind this to to really recognize this as the as the fulcrum. Yes.
So when do you meet with the uh, president of the National uh, Academy? The 21st uh, for lunch, and then, uh, then we're having a two-day meeting, three days, and uh, from 21st to the 23rd. Excellent, excellent. And, and we'll be so I'll be able to have conversations on and off with them periodically, and I hope to uh, uh, pass on your information. My, and my my message will be say, you know, this, uh, you you have to hear the story. You have to get, you pass it, give me information, and um, look at all this list of people. And, and your on your left column, you have all your resources. Mm -hmm. There's about, about 100 of them. <laughs> you, you, you really got an incredible list. Um, and uh, you know, if you want to see the dimensions of this and recognize uh, the importance of it, and, and you, you know, STEM is math and science is never going to be. It's only going to be superficially taught to a very the same people that are being taught now. You're never going to. You're not going to change the depth. That it's, change it's, the number. Yeah, right. But we, you are you and I are on the same wavelength. That's for sure. So, what can I do to support you? Uh, what can you do to support me? <laughs> I'm sort of on a mission <laughs> myself for the last 30, 40 years. Um, yeah. Be going way back to say get. Maybe we could talk again, just to kind of uh, be in freshest possible sync before you go into that meeting. Yeah, uh, that, that's a good idea. Yeah. I'll, I'll prepare myself. Uh, I, I'm, what I'm really proposing, in a sense, is you know the broader view mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, we need to reconstitute and strengthen, and from from a really fundamental point of view. The depth and breadth of, uh, of K-12 education to the point of, of liberal education for all. Right. So that it isn't just uh, it isn't just reading. I mean, it's uh, reading about something. And, you know, you know, it's children's literature, um, and it's great uh, dimensions. There are wonderful, wonder, incredible children's books out there that kids should be reading in literature, but also in the Reading stuff like uh, in, in our magazine, you're probably have you seen our? Did I send them to you? Oh, no, you haven't. I did peruse some of what's available online oh, okay. just to kind of get a yeah, sense I, of I your we, operation there. But I don't know if I sent them to you the last few days or not. Uh, but no, you sent me the Gathering Storm and yeah, the that's uh, all, booklet that's all. Okay. on you. Yeah. On I your just sent you a set of the whole all the magazine. Okay, because, love that. Uh, the three with the Smithsonian are are powerful medicine for kids and. and uh, once they get bitten, once they once they have an appetite and a capacity to pro progress in that space, and and uh, it's, it's it's really designed to attract uh, you know critical thinking and encourage critical thinking in, in a very humorous way. Right. Uh, the the uh, cartoonist Larry Gonick is the guy who uh, wrote the cartoon history of the world. And huh. I think he's a I think he's a physicist or something like that. I don't know he's the original. But he's uh, the funniest guy in the world for, for young kids about. You know, oh, I'd love to look at that. I'd love to look at that. And uh, we used the, uh, we invented uh, Muse, you know, Muse was after the Muses. Uh huh. Uh, and we invented about a dozen modern Muses to ask dumb questions, sort of like a Greek chorus. <laughs> huh. and, have, and have a dialogue with each other. And. Uh, so they're 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 on the margins, just like with Cricket Magazine, except they're they they um, they're more pointed questions. Mm, I'd love to see that. I I, I really appreciate. It. I, uh, have you ever read uh, Metamagical Themas by Hofstetter? No, I've I, I've uh, looked at his anti-intellectualism in America, but I don't know I don't know that one. Oh, there was a piece. There was a piece. That, he has all kinds of strange stuff, but there was one piece in which he did. Um, a number of playful dialogues to, to exercise out certain points. Oh. And, and, and he and a number of people have used that, you know, a metaphoric framework of multiple personalities in dialogue to draw out understanding. And I've always thought that that was a nice, you know, mechanism. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll send you that stuff. Uh, I've uh, spent a lot of time on the International Baccalaureate, too. Yeah, I d actually did a presentation for the International Brecht Laureate Hawaii in 1983 or something, 90, ni early 90s. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, I enjoyed working with that organization. Well, I, I got involved with uh, Alec Peterson uh, back in about 1970, 
72 or 73 and been working, we, we worked together and, and founded the North American office. Huh. Wow. You've, uh, you've certainly been a force for change in this world. Oh, well, I've been working at it for a long time, that's for sure. Yeah. And so that's, that's, that's my goal with the National Academies is really that literacy is, is, is a crucial thing, but, but the goal is, uh, you know, real education before you get to college. Yeah, you got to, like the Europeans have been doing, it started in, uh, as, as Rick Hover pointed out, it started in Berlin in 18, you know, 1810 or so. He said a, a rigorous secondary education, and that's what created the European Research University. Yeah. And there's such a difference between, you know, uh, in one of my other wor worlds in the implicity site, you know, it, it, I put forth that, you know, education is always oriented from the outside in, but learning is always oriented from the inside out. Mm, yeah. And, and we've, in order to be more effective in education, we've got to be able to resource kids relative to what they need from the inside out, not our models about them mm -hmm. looking from the outside in. And, and we're, you know, the literacy thing is what's choking and disabling learning on a massive scale, but the education um, system as a whole um, is misoriented with respect to the health of learning in general. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... <laughs> We're not going to get very far by by stirring the stuff in the cat box. This is one of the beauties of the uh, theory of knowledge course in the International Baccalaureate. Uh, uh -huh. To uh, to get the real inquiry into um, uh, across the discipline. Is that uh, kind of epistemological profiling? That's what it is. Yeah. And, you know all the, all all the basics. You know, like in, you know, mathematical, scientific, uh, historical, ethical, right, uh, aesthetic uh, values. Yes, but you. But the thing is, is, how do we get kids? One of the examples I used to use is how do we get children not to be able to know what Isaac Newton said and did, but to put themselves in a situation where they authentically ask for themselves, why doesn't the moon fall? Mm -hmm. and then resource their learning from that authentic question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? How do we create environments that do that? Mm -hmm. Right. Great. Okay, well... Um, it's a pleasure, sir. Thank you so much. I'll send you some, some more stuff, uh, some background information that's, uh, for, that I've been working on, and uh, I'll send you some copies of the magazines. Appreciate that. Thank you. We uh, collected, um, there's now three books out that uh, sort of give, uh, describe my interests. Um, so I want to celebrate cricket, which is sort of the story of how we started Cricket Magazine and our goals and objectives and the first issues and the wonderful authors and illustrators we had. So now it's 30, 33 years. And we um, have worked, been working with Jay Matthews. Do you know, know that name? Jay Matthews, yeah, I do. He's with, uh, he's a, um, isn't he in the press? He's a journalist. Journalist. He's in Post. And yes, yes, yes. In fact, I think I tried to contact him years ago, uh -huh. and he was, you know, when you've got some kind of demonstrable results to some particular experiment, you know, get a hold of me. But he didn't want to wade into anything until so he got to a certain level of concreteness, as I recall. That's right. Yeah. And he, he, he's the one who discovered... Uh, um, this Hispanic in the LA schools, uh, uh, Jamie. Oh right, the um, Jamie, stand uh, and deliver guy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He's he, there was a little article, and then he went and actually visited the classrooms and just could decide it was really authentic and, and really wrote a big article about it. Made him famous. Made him famous. Made a movie. All that. All that flows from so, uh, their little switches. Yeah. So we got Jay to write a story about the history of the IB in America. Huh. So it's uh, that's a fun book called The Super Test. It published a year ago. And uh, that describes a little bit what we did in starting and financing and hiring and and working with Alec Peterson to start the IB, IB International Baccalaureate in North America. Wow. This was the first uh, sort of independent national group outside of Geneva to raise money in America, of course. 
but it, it also set up the model for regional offices around the world. So I got on the council. I've been working with them for you know, 30 years. Um, and we published that book as well as uh, Alec Peterson's uh, biography. I don't know about, well, story about the IP. And then uh, a recent book, we, we had a, a journalist, a, a really a crack journalist in the Chicago Reader, uh, gave me the opportunity to look at our archives in, in open court. And so he wrote a story about uh, our struggles against the establishment for the last, uh, you know, from 62 to 96 when we sold it to SRA McGaw Hill. So along the lines of the book. Uh, yeah, right. So that was, uh, and so it's going to be published in a couple weeks. Really? Well, congratulations on that. It's called uh, uh, Let's Kill Dick and Jane. Oh, I've read most of that. Well, I gave it to you. Right? Yes, yes. I was wondering if you were talking about an article right. different from the, that's what I've been referring to as the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, okay. That's the book. It'll be, it'll be out in a formal way in, in two weeks. Good. Oh, good. So I'm going to send it to all the journalists, a lot of you know, key journalists. That he's that's right. I remember you. I sent you a copy. You, you said you read it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wonderful talking with you. Uh, so um, I will give you a call then. Um, I'll be thinking about it. And uh, before I go, I'm going to be down in Bloomington that uh, Monday and Tuesday. Uh, but I'll probably give you a call before that about, the, about two weeks from now. Sounds good. I look forward to that conversation. Good, David. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.